and invest in infrastructure, deal with all these security architectures, it is, it'll, it, if, if you get enough volume, it'll probably be worse than the signature bloat problem that we are trying to deal with today. And um, the other thing is a lot of these devices are undocumented. Um, I don't know how many of you were here for Joe's talk in the morning, but one of the things that Joe was saying was that you know, a lot of these devices are built around reference designs. And um, yes, that is true. So you can learn a lot of information from these reference designs and other side channels. But there are a lot of other classes of devices out there for various reasons, they wouldn't even give you access to a reference design or any literature other than the basic data sheet for contractual and license reasons. Um, for example, optical disk controllers. DVD, CCA do not want you to mess with low-level chipsets that deal with optical drives. You will not get a vendor to return your call. <laughs> you will not get an SDK. If you're lucky, they won't sue you. <laughs> I mean, DVD CCA is mad about these things, so like there, there's classes of hardware out there that you can't even get a reference design for. You can't even find some of the chipset numbers and the identifications on the web. So a lot of these things are largely undocumented. And you know, when it comes to runtime debugging for analysis purposes, um, we have some pretty cool stuff on the CPU side of things, but on all these peripheral devices, we, we, we are kind of like, um, I think the technical expression is SOL. I'm not going to spell out what it is. Um, you, you can not kind of like, I mean, if, if you are particularly sophisticated, you can kind of get around some of these things. Like, you know, like some of the stuff that Joe is doing, you know, hook it up, see if there's LPC port or a JTAG port that is still enabled. Try to get some code injection happening so you can wire up a rudimentary debugger in there. So, so there are things that can be done, but it's not going to be like loading, up, loading it up in IDA or running it through Metasm to clean it up and just loading it up in IDA or whatever. So it's going to take a bit more work to just get to the level where you can deal with some of this stuff. I mean, for a lot of these devices, you get like a blob and you don't even know what instruction set it is. You don't know where it's mapped in memory. You don't know what the register spaces are. You don't know how the memory address space is partitioned. So it, it takes a lot of prep work to get to the point where you can analyze some of this stuff. So um, <laughs> why shouldn't malcode run on these things? For exact same reasons. But I mean, obviously, the defensive and offensive side is different, right? I mean, I have a friend who always says that offense is pure. It, well, it is true. It is narrow and deep, whereas defense has to be wide, and hopefully deep. I mean, it's not going to happen, but it has to be wide and deep. So for, for someone who is interested in writing mal code, like especially in a targeted scenario, say for example, com company X buys all their computers from Dell. Their latest batch was like 100,000 computers or how many amount of the same model because IT likes to keep things simple. So there's this whole lot of homogeneous hardware out there and you can just focus on one of the interesting devices in there. Spend your time on it. You know, there you go. You get well, you got one in hundred thousand chances of just getting it in there. If you're lucky, so for malware writers, the game is a little bit different. So they have the ability to bite down and just spend a bit more time on these things. Um, okay, so does everyone agree that it's kind of bad out there? OK, so I will go and discuss an actual example and walk through some of the things that have some of the development process and what can be done with it. But before that, let's, um, let's figure out, let's, let's see, I mean, how can we potentially sort out this mess? What can we potentially do? I mean, like, who do we have to visit with a baseball bat, right? So, uh, or, or a check, I mean, either way. <laughs> Sometimes the check would make, might make a bit better. Um, OK, device manufacturers, obviously. Um, computer vendors, operating system vendors, um, security and system management software vendors, especially in the enterprise. It's not a trivial process of just walking there and just taking inventory of what's on every computer and making sure that everything is up to date. So we need all these guys to play a ball to kind of like work through this stuff. 
Um, device manufacturers. OK. Um, probably most of my gripes are directed towards them. Um, for crying out loud, this is 2009. Stick to a strong SDL or any SDL. I mean, you know, we, we, we talk about how a secure development lifecycle is important for OS vendors and application software vendors. What about hardware manufacturers? What about device manufacturers? First of all, verify your hardware. Ensure that it can only do what it's meant to do. Audit your firmware and drivers. There's a reason for this. I will, I will focus on that a bit later. Um, Convince your chipset manufacturers, your operating system, your real-time operating system manufacturers, your SDK and library vendors, or even sometimes the compiler vendors, to at least audit their code from time to time if they can't stick to a proper SDL. And why is this important? For the same reason that Joe mentioned, Joe was talking about when it comes to the reference designs. When you, when you buy a chipset these days to build your hardware around, what you get is a chipset, a reference design, and an SDK, and sometimes even a compiler and supporting libraries. So you, you write your specific features on top of it. You don't even touch what's underneath. And quite honestly, there's a lot of device manufacturers and people that I've spoken to who write firmware for a living who had no idea of the capabilities of the underlying chipset. I mean, at the time, it was great for me because I was actually getting the chipset to do things that you know it was never meant to do. But um, yeah, it was it was baffling as to what percentage of people I spoke to out there didn't really even understand the hardware. They were given an SDK, they were given the documentation, so they they treated the SDK like the actual representation of the hardware. But obviously, it was not an exact one-to-one -one mapping. The chips often the chipsets are a lot more capable than the SDK would expose. So it's extremely important to have all these guys play ball and audit their stuff. Because sometimes the device manufacturer might not even know why they got owned. Focus developer attention to security when producing code. I mean, this goes without saying for the entire industry, but especially in electrical engineering and device manufacturing, that type of thing, they're under a lot of different types of pressures. They want to get the device out in least amount of time. And not often do people come and complain. It's not like the White House is going to give them a call and say, hey, you've got a problem with your UPNP. You know, it doesn't happen very often, sir. They've got this situation where they err on the side of convenience as opposed to security. So that really needs to change. And also, the developers have to be educated about the greater security model in which the device operates. I mean, this goes to the thing with driver, driver riders, too. I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but um, there are many <laughs> class drivers in Windows which implements a certain security model for their devices so that it doesn't actually break the OS security or attempt to break the OS security. And then, then there's a low-level transport driver rider who, goes and set, who doesn't go and set any ACL on their driver. So anybody and their dog can actually send device IO controls to it. So these device manufacturers and developers need to understand the greater security model in which they operate. Um, device developers, do it yourself. Don't trust the driver. Don't expect, firstly, that the driver you're talking to is the driver written by your guys. And secondly, don't expect the driver to pass things that it's only meant to pass. Same goes for device driver riders. Don't trust devices to return valid data or responses. I mean, there, there are many faulty drivers out there that can be exploited by devices that are masquerading to be the device those drivers are intended for, but not. So um, I mean, ring zero injection by just plugging some